As we saw in chapter 11, the solid phase is characterized by strong attractions between particles, which prevent these particles from moving past each other. However, we mostly focused on molecular solids, but there are three other types of solids. In this lesson, we'll learn about the four different ways that solids bond together and learn how to distinguish each type by its properties. The four types of solids we'll look at are molecular solids, ionic solids, metallic solids, and covalent network solids. We spent a good portion of chapter 11 talking about molecular solids. Molecular solids are made exclusively of nonmetal atoms. These atoms are covalently bonded into discrete molecules, and these molecules are stuck together by intermolecular forces. Because IMFs are weaker than covalent bonds, molecular solids have relatively low melting and boiling points. Any substance you can think of which would melt on a stovetop is likely a molecular solid. Examples include ice, wax, and sugar. We introduced ionic solids in chapter two. These compounds consist of alternating cations and anions held together by electrostatic attractions between positive and negative charges. Because ionic bonds are some of the strongest bonds, these compounds have incredibly high melting and boiling points. The highest of all compounds. Ionic solids are sometimes soluble in water, as we saw when learning about precipitation reactions and the solution process. They will not conduct electricity as a solid, but they will if they are melted or dissolved. Examples of ionic solids are anything described as salt, including table salt, rust, and calcium carbonate, the main component of antacid, limestone, and marble. One thing you might wonder, if ionic bonds are the strongest type of bond, why are ionic solids so brittle? The answer is in the arrangement of the ions. The ions are arranged as alternating positive and negative charges, meaning each ion is surrounded by its best friends, ions of the opposite charge. However, if a strong external force pushes the ions out of alignment by less than even one nanometer, then each ion is suddenly next to ions of the same charge, their worst enemy. The like charges repel each other and the crystal cracks, usually along a single plane. This plane is called a facet and leads to the geometric shape characteristic of many ionic crystals. In contrast to the prior two solids, metallic solids are usually composed of only one element, which is always a metal. The metal atoms have loosely held outer electrons, which are delocalized over the entire volume of the metal. We describe this as an electron C, where the valence electrons flow around the islands composed of nuclei and core electrons. Delocalized electrons are very stable, making these bonds quite strong, and metals have high melting and boiling points. The delocalized valence electrons can also conduct electricity, because metals are uncharged and nonpolar, they do not dissolve in water. Since metals are held together by delocalized electrons, it makes them very bendy, unlike our fragile ionic solids. If you hit a metal with a hammer, the atoms may deform, but the delocalized electrons can easily adopt to the new shape and the metal stays together. Metals are well known for being ductile, which is the ability to form flexible wires. Metals are also malleable, meaning they can be bent to almost any shape. Gold is the most malleable metal and can be flattened into a sheet just 100 nanometers thick, which is called gold leaf. The last class of solid is the covalent network solid, which is composed only of nonmetal or semi-metals. The atoms are connected in an array of covalent bonds, sort of like if the entire solid was one single molecule. 
Because the atoms are held together by covalent bonds, they have much higher melting and boiling points than molecular solids. They're also insoluble in water. Some covalent network solids are conductors, some are semiconductors, and others are great insulators. Examples of covalent network solids are glass, diamond, and silicon. I'd like to take a moment to reflect on two of my favorite covalent solids. First, we have silicon dioxide. Silicon is in carbon's family, so it likes to make four bonds, while oxygen likes to make two bonds. Because these bonds are very strong, and both elements are extremely common on Earth, we have a lot of silicon dioxide. When the silicon and oxygen atoms are arranged in an ordered crystal, it is referred to as quartz. Notice, in the picture of quartz, we see that quartz breaks along its facets, just like ionic crystals. This is because both substances have ordered planes of atoms. When the silicon and oxygen atoms do not have long range order, we get the familiar substance glass. Glass is a miracle substance. Not only is it strong enough to stand on, it is transparent and can withstand very high temperatures, but it can also be melted down and molded into any shape from large slabs to thin wires. Most importantly to chemists, glass is nearly unreactive and provides a see-through vessel to contain and observe reactions. Another common form of silicon dioxide is sand, which is mostly composed of very small chunks of silicon dioxide, plus a lot of impurities, which gives sand its many colors. It may be cliche, but it's no secret that my favorite element is carbon. Carbon can bond in millions of different ways, and in each way obtains different properties. Carbon forms two main covalent network solids. When carbon is sp3 hybridized and arranged in an extended array of tetrahedral bonds, it forms diamond. Because of the perfect 109.5 degree bond angles and strong carbon-carbon bonds, diamond is the hardest natural substance and has excellent thermal conductivity. But because of the localized electrons between the carbon atoms, it has practically zero electrical conductivity. When carbon is sp2 hybridized, it arranges itself in sheets called graphite. While the bonds between the carbon atoms of each sheet are very strong, the sheets are held together only by weak dispersion forces, and they can slide off each other very easily. Pencil lead is made of graphite and makes marks on paper thanks to these slidey sheets. If we look closely at the sp2 bonding within the graphite sheet, we see alternating double and single bonds, just like in benzene. This makes graphite resonance stabilized by delocalized electrons in the p orbitals. Delocalized electrons means that graphite can conduct electricity just like a metal, but it can only conduct electricity in two dimensions along the sheets. Electricity cannot move between the sheets because there are no electron overlaps between sheets. Compare this to diamond, which is an excellent insulator simply due to its different hybridization. Carbon has applications in nanomaterials as well. 60 carbon atoms can arrange themselves into a soccer ball shape called a Buckminster fullerene or buckyball. Scientists are working on ways to trap atoms, molecules, or ions within the cage of a buckyball as a way to store, transport, or stabilize these compounds. A single sheet of graphite is called graphene, and it has incredibly high electrical conductivity due to its delocalized electrons. When graphene is rolled into a tube, it forms a carbon nanotube. Depending on how the atoms are arranged, carbon nanotubes can either be highly electrically conductive, like a metal, or not conductive at all. Carbon nanotubes are tiny, but very strong and they can be added to a plastic to produce a strong but light composite material. 
Now, carbon may be a miracle element, but we humans have been really overdoing it lately. One of the most chemically stable forms of carbon is carbon dioxide. And have you ever worn a dark shirt on a sunny day and gotten too hot? This is because dark colors absorb light, which causes them to heat up. If your eyes could detect infrared light, you would see the skies darkening with each passing year. As carbon dioxide absorbs the infrared light that would otherwise be scattered into space, the world heats up. This is not difficult to understand. If we don't act quickly, Earth will start to resemble its neighbor, Venus, whose 96% carbon dioxide atmosphere keeps the planet at a comfortable 470 degrees Celsius day and night. Science and technology can help us but it will not be enough. Humans need to consume less. Consume less gasoline, consume less plastic, and consume less meat. Consume less consumerism. The older generations have really fucked this thing up, but I remain hopeful that my generation and your generation and future generations can and will work together to make Earth a healthier and fairer place for all life. This is the last lesson, and I want to thank you for joining me as we explore the most amazing and badass things in the universe. Do not hesitate to reach out to me with your chemistry questions, no matter how far in the future it is. I hope to see you grow and expand into wonderful humans. Please be good to yourself, be good to each other, and be good to our planet. Goodbye.